right, welcome to Illuminati Africa. And uh, I hope you like that clip. We're going to uh, tell you why I showed that clip as you watch uh, our session today. I'm here with two young gentlemen who are based in Germany doing software development. And we're going to be talking about remote work. Sit right there and do share with us where you're watching it from. Share with your friends and let's have a good time today. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Kenneth Geary and this is Illuminati Africa. And I'm with two young men here who have practically experienced what it means to exit their homelands in pursuit of greener pastures. And they're gonna share their experience, um, share their motivations. And then we're gonna also look at the um, the, the thoughts shared in previous versions of a few sessions of this topic, remote work in tech. And we're going to try to align or um, compare experience with ideas shared by Faith and Henrique in previous sessions. Before I proceed, I'm going to ask our gentlemen guests to introduce themselves very briefly. And I'm going to start from Patrick. Can you please tell us who you are and what you do? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, um, I'm Patrick Kulo, a software developer um, here in Germany. Um, I grew up in Ghana, born, schooled and everything in Ghana. Um, I, I had an opportunity to do my master's degree here in Europe. So after my master's degree, then um, I got a job here in Europe as a software mm -hmm. developer. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a professional scrum master and then a professional product owner and also a software developer. Yeah, so wow. Me. Yeah. Patrick will never lack a job in Europe. Developer, <laughs> scrum master, and uh, what was the third one? Product, product owner. Product owner. Pro yeah. Awesome. Very yeah, when I was in Ghana, I, 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 most of my jobs were with product ownership. So, I mean, that was what I was doing. And then when I moved to Europe, then I, I switched my, my career to software development. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. Uh, let's listen to Joseph uh, share your thoughts, your personality with us today. Yeah, yeah I'm Joseph. Davis, um, I'm a software developer here in Germany also. And um, yeah, I, I'm also a Ghanaian. I grew up in Ghana, went to school in Ghana. I actually did computer science at um, Kane UST and also did my master's in IT also there and um, started in, um, I've been a software developer for close to 10 years. I've worked in like um, FinTech. I've worked mm -hmm. for build software for banks and in the NGO space, built um, software for um, agrotech, um, satellite communication, and and all that. And here, and I'm here in Germany now. Yeah, so so far there. So far, so far. Wow, thank you, Kuju. Thank you so much. Good to have you, gentlemen, join us. So don't be um, mis don't be misled, so to speak, by their soft voices. We're going to have a very hot conversation today about remote work. So stay tuned and do let us know where you're coming from. I'm gonna uh, dish out the first question and hear thoughts. Um, I'm gonna dish out the question, then I'll play a short clip uh, from our last uh, en engagement, and that will guide the conversation that we're gonna have, an, have on that question. The question is, some people that are watching this video now or will watch it later, maybe young people who want to go to Europe or who want to uh, um, get some remote work doing from Africa, like Faith told us the last time. If a young person watching you were to rep 
repeat the steps you took to get to where you are in your career today, what would those steps look like? What would be the key elements uh, of the steps and what would be the pitfalls to avoid? So I'm going to ask Patrick to answer that. But before Patrick answers that, I'm going to just um, share my screen and uh, play this short clip as a supporting content. Thing that I would encourage our talent to grow in Africa and everyone that wants to, you know, maximize the opportunities that are given that, that the, um, the digital uh, workspace is opening is to um, mod, have multiple skill sets. Um, I need, uh, we need to save much of this. Of course, you may be good with graphic design, but you know the trade game of them. Um, of course, because you, opportunities may not be coming in graphic design and then you, you move into it. And you are able to take them from the trade in all times outside what you're going to give you, what else can you do? I think we need to um, get more of these multiple skills. All right, so Patrick, I hope you got the question and you're ready for it. Yeah, Tell yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, on the video, I, I totally agree with, with Faith of I guess that's his name. I, I totally agree yes. with him that you, you need to have um multiple skills like multiple talent they should be you should you should you should, you should be like um the jack of all trades you should because the competition here is 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 not that easy because you have people coming from all over the world people coming from africa some also coming from some parts of europe some also coming from the america south america and everything so you should always have the extra thing that that someone else does not have so like if a recruiter wants to pick you and the recruiter is picking maybe a front-end developer and then all you have is a front-end developer and all, all all the people that comes in have maybe react no js and all those front-end developing tools but they don't have any experience in the back-end aspects then you who has that that skill set then you has you have the the extra edge over all those other all those other series that counts for them to screen so for me, I think you should have all of that. You should have. You should be the multi-purpose person. You know. Mm. Um. So back to the what question. What was your experience like personally? In that so, context. Yeah, yeah. So for my experience, um, mine, mine was my mind was tweaked a little bit towards computing at a very young age, actually. So, uh, when I when I completed my my basic education, GSS, um, instead of me sitting at home waiting for my results. Uh, my dad, my dad enrolled me in the computer school for me to learn basic stuff with computers like um, Word, Excel, and those things. And that time, we're using Windows ninety eight. Hmm. You know, so from the beginning, exactly. So from the beginning, my my mind was kind of enthusiastic or kind of happy about knowing a lot of stuff about computing. Even before I went to my secondary school. So right after secondary school. I already knew what I wanted to do. I already knew that I wanted to do computer science and this is what I wanted to do, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, even though I had a little part or I had a little help from the beginning, um, in a way I slacked to, you know, because um, currently what I know, what I'm doing, I would have wished that I would have learned a lot of it when I was in school. You know, I'm not saying um, the university education is bad or it's not it's not this thing, but I feel like we do a lot of theory stuff in Africa and we don't do a lot of practical things in okay. Africa. Um, here in Germany, for example, like we work with people who don't even have bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. You know, they just have traineeship or traineeship certificates and they are very good at what they do, you know. Mm. So I feel like, Apart from the school teaching us the theory stuff, they should also teach us what the market needs, you know, mm -hmm. like how to use Git, how to use Jira, um, how to, um, what's the name? Um, um, I, I've forgotten the word. Uh, maybe Davis can help me. Uh, um, uh, version controlling tools. Version and control, stuff. okay. Mm -hmm. That's version controlling tools and stuff. I mean, the thing that the market needs right now. I think um, we should, our schools should focus on that. And as a young person, 
even though you have the academics there, you should also try and focus on those bits more if you want to have a remote job somewhere or if you want to if if you want to migrate out of the country. I also mm. I also use this one to chip in the advice that don't ever think of migrating out of the country and not having any qualification or any education. I mean it's a very <laughs> dangerous thing to do. Yeah. You have to have some form of education, some form of qualification, some form of experience. Um, in my school, my university, we're encouraged to do um, internship every um, every long vac. So mm. then I also had the experience of office office environment experience back home. You know, so I think that you shouldn't be the the only one place or one aspect to to only concentrate on on the academics but you also mm. concentrate on the things that the the environment or the um the industry the needs okay. yeah, exactly and at, in europe i'm um, trust me we work with people davis can even be at uh, can be i uh, can even tell you we work with people who don't even have a bachelor's degree in computer mm -hmm. science or anything but maybe because of the lens some course on coursera or udemy and they've had some work experience with it and they are very good at that so they are working there and then they are they are taking their money here so for me for me a young person of my age or, or young me that's what mm -hmm. i advise the person to do even though concentrate on your academics but learn the things that the industry needs now what's mm -hmm. the what the industry uh, demands now learn them more and be good mm -hmm. at it yeah yeah so find the skill let your education be relevant to the market relevant to the, the market find out what what is what is being requested yeah. in the labor market and yeah. focus on acquiring the skills mostly through practical experience more than yeah. just knowing the background great thank you for that really. insight let's hear from davis uh joseph i like the could you davis tell us your experience in that context uh, yeah, so um, with me, uh, I think I was telling my own story. Um, I think after high school, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do in university. But all that I knew was I wanted to do something that would build, that will, that would be like, okay, I'm building stuff. Say like, okay, um, I built this or I did, um, I did that. So I think um, at that time, my dad, um, he he's a uh, um, he's a retired lecturer. He he actually lectured me computer science in Kenya University. Um, he was out of the country for, I think, to do his doctorate, something. And he came back. And at that time, I was just out of high school. And um, all that um, I saw him was behind the computer. He was mostly behind the computer all the time. And I I saw him reading books. So I, when he moves away, I just go there out of curiosity. Then I saw a book on Java right yeah, java is a programming language yes. right and then i picked the book it had a cd for installation and all that we had a desktop i started doing it myself then i just i just started reading the book and using the book started then i wrote my first hello world mm -hmm. then there was a part that lets you program like a pop-up window then a pop-up came i wrote whatever i wanted to then it came up and i got i'm like wow i did this Mm. Right. I knew at that point, I knew like I did this and I was like, wow. From there, I just yeah, then he asked me, what course do I want to do in the university? I was like, now computer science or other computer engineering. But for some reason, <laughs> um, this might sound funny. The science sounded nice to me than the engineering. <laughs> So I was like, okay, computer science. But before I got into the university, I practiced a bit. So I actually knew what I was going to do there. But um, with the current youth, actually, in if you're a youth, and even from SHS, SHS coming up, at least you should have an idea what you want to do in university, right? And check what's relevant, in, in especially in Ghana, not what's outside mm -hmm. Ghana. Mm -hmm. You might be learning stuff that's relevant outside, but not relevant in because it is, it is in Ghana that you start from. That's where you get your first employment and all that there. So um, I got into the university, and for for me, um, I was a lecturer's son. And when people saw me, they 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 comes with some additional pressure, like you have to be like the first class student, so those and all that. But 
I wasn't there because of first class because I, I, I saw that there was theory and there was the practical, it's computer science. And I always remember one thing that my dad told me. My dad told me that in the university, yes, I'm a lecturer, we are lecturers. The lecturer is supposed to present the topic to you. Mm. Not actually teach you, present the topic yeah. to you. The rest mm -hmm. is up to you. So 20% wow. is the lecturer and 80% is you. So mm -hmm. I would advise like any youth, especially if you go to an university or from SHS or going on that, especially in IT, it is you, it's practical whatever you want to know and whatever and now there, there are unlimited resources on the internet right find what's relevant for the market and if you want to find what's relevant um in the market just go to the job sites mm. especially in ghana just look at what they are looking for the technologies that they are looking if you look at if you go to three four job adverts and all that you can see what's what's actually in the market and what they are doing so that like, you learn um towards um that side and you know you're learning towards the job description yes and normally and um actually personally at the university i filtered the courses that i paid attention to mm. right i i was looking for courses that would make me relevant right um and uh, but but what my friend what what the question that i i, I asked myself was okay which course, right? Will, will which course will make me relevant, and which course will let me make money, right? And then I realized it was more like the programming, building softwares, and and all that. So I paid attention to that part, the practical aspect, even though there were cool courses like accounting and economics in there and all that. But I I didn't pay much attention there. I kept programming. Then I think in my second year. I got a chance to, there was a lecturer who had a company, then he was picking the good programming students, right? And uh, that was when I had my first like relevant um, 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 uh, job experience, right? I had an internship there and in the internship we were supposed to build a banking application. Mm. And it was hands-on. We, I even had the opportunity to, as a second year, um, student um, at Kenya University, I had the opportunity to interview um, IT directors at Bank of Ghana and all that mm. to get to know about banking systems mm. and all that. Yeah, so wow. that's uh, that's like my story. But um, for any youth, right? Um, first, is to focus on relevant things that are relevant mm. to uh, and um, I I'll chip in from from the video, what I think Faith was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, and Patrick was saying, you, you can be, a, yes, you can be a jack of all trade, but know your strengths. Mm. Because yeah. software, even, even, even in the space of software, is broad. Yeah. There are so many languages. There are, there's what each language can do and can help you do or not do. There's web, there's the front end, there's the back end. So know where your strengths are and what you're interested in. If you try to do everything, um, everything and all stuff, you might end up burning out and you might lose motivation. Mm -hmm. And and actually, and actually, the passion, the passion also counts, right? Yeah. You must have passion for because i've met a lot of young guys who are like okay i want to be like you and i tell okay you do this and this and that and that and that, and that. they start one week two weeks to they come back uh this thing is quite difficult it's really hard it's right <laughs> we we all went through that phase but yeah, when yeah. Time, we had a passion for it if you yeah. don't have the passion uh, at the point in time you give up mm. yeah wow. so thank we, you so much yeah <laughs> One more quick yeah, quick Patrick. About the about the passion that he yeah. said, this is this is very very true, especially in in programming and software development. I mean, you get stuck with some things, and the only thing that can push you is passion. You need to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't enjoy it, you you quick you quit you quit quickly. Quickly, yeah. So, yeah. So the passion parts, I also agree with him. You have to enjoy what you're doing, not for the money. Or not mm. for something else, but you are doing it because you love it. Yeah, beautiful. You know, I've picked up amazing lessons.
from what you've said, and I'll, and I'll run down a, a few of them. But before that, I would like to acknowledge Prince. Prince joined us early on. Glad to be here. And just as we were, uh, that's what Prince said. Welcome, Prince. Great, great to see you. Please tell us where you're coming, uh, watching from. Dr. Faith Mobia is also watching. So as he was speaking about his video, he was also contributing, saying, brilliant conversation, gentlemen. We must emphasize more apprenticeship learning from your superiors more or less and vocational training programs focusing more on skills rather than just uh, empty knowledge yeah. right from the early school age to ensure we close the huge skills gaps today thank you for that dr faith Mobia. and um, i think this is irene saying spot on insightful i don't see the identity uh, there's some security around the profile now um i i want to pick on what you said first of all both of you had strong guidance from your parents, strong input from your parents. Uh, Patrick said right from early on, uh, I, be, I believe after your secondary school, your father and my, my just, junior, my junior, my JSS. Junior high, right? Yeah, junior high, junior high, yeah. Your dad enrolled you in, in, in computer school. And um, Kuju says that his father was a lecturer and because he saw that he was always with this computer, he got interested picked up Java and began to build software. So he had clarity before even he went into the university. And I like the emphasis on uh, liking what you do, passion. These days, we our attention span is shorter. Uh, our, our drive for immediate gratification is greater. So very few young people want to be patient enough to learn development for five years. But work always pays off. In the end, there is no age that will, uh, you know, dismount that principle. When we're able to pay our dues at the end of the day, we, we, we get paid, just like uh, Patrick and Kojo. I'm going to go to the next question, but before that, let me play this quick video. Let me, let, let me just clear it out before you build it up. Let me clear it out before you build it up. That thing that needs to be clear quickly because. Um, the project that is the U.S. is not spending, they, they are spending um, the cost, matter, not, in, in, in labor, in trying to decide the price of labor, I mean, labor is not this, that's my field. So, um, in trying to decide the price of labor, a lot of things coming into play to decide the labor, price of labor. So, um, you're looking at um, the environment, environmental factors come into play. And when you're looking at the environment, when you're selecting environmental factors, you're looking at cost of living, right, in that, in that environment, right? So these are the things that also matter, you know. So in 2016, for example, in 2016, I uh, obtained my diploma at the university and I searched an employer. I was, I, I, I was needing a, a job. So um, it was really, really difficult to find an employer. Alors que euh, j'étais vraiment compétent, il y avait même des compétents, euh, il y avait même des concours dans mon pays euh, dans lesquels on cherchait des meilleurs développeurs. On était souvent des personnes qui étaient bien euh, positionnées dans les concours. Mais euh, les compétences ne suffisaient pas pour que nous puissions trouver un emploi. Mmh. Euh, donc j'étais un très bon développeur, mes amis étaient des très bons développeurs, mais on n'arrivait pas à trouver un emploi. Alors c'est que nous avons... All right, so let's come back to us. So I played two videos there, and uh, if you're watching uh, uh, on us live now, you can go back to our YouTube channel to see the details of those videos. But first of all, Dr. Faith Mwobia debunked uh, uh, one of our theories and arguments in that conversation while he was talking about the fact that why would I be paid so much more working in Europe or working for a European company uh, in Ghana, uh, and uh, the, the the second speaker talked about his search for a job uh, in 2016 before he realized that, look, my skills are good enough to start a business. That is uh, Henrique Mukanda of I Taught Africa. So let me turn over to Patrick and ask you, what were the strongest drivers for you uh, when you, you, that drove that decision to say, I want to work outside Ghana. I want to pick up a job outside my country. What were the strongest drivers? Is it something you deliberately planned? Tell us. 
Um, it, it well, honestly, um, it wasn't a planned thing actually. Um, so before I left, when I was working in a very good company, I don't know if you know Haptel. Haptel, yep, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, I was a product manager there. Wow. And, I mean, the working environment there is great. I mean, everything is good. Um, I joined them, I think, for a year. And then I had opportunity to do my master's degree um, outside. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very expensive in Ghana for me, actually. So I had this scholarship that was a fully funded um, uh, scholarship. So it includes um, your tuition, accommodation, and then feeding. So I was like, ah, OK. <laughs> if 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 I mean I can get the opportunity to do my master's degree and then mm -hmm. maybe I can give it a shot there in Europe. Why why not? I don't know. Even if I graduate and I return back home, I have a master's degree, so I can I can I can go back to my company or start something to do. So <clears throat> when I came to Europe, um, first of all, I noticed something about the way they teach in <laughs> in their classroom, the universities. I mean, their way of their their way of teaching is. It's, it's it's totally different from the way they teach us in in africa i don't know maybe because it's a bachelor's degree but like most of the things most of them were dependent on on practicals practicals the theory was very very little and and it was so easy you know <laughs> it was so easy the environment was so serene like everything was just there for you to to grab every opportunity succeed. exactly to succeed and I mean, during that time in the university, too, I had the opportunity. There are some other bits and perks that comes with it, like you get scholarship to go and study abroad, or you get scholarship to go and do internship somewhere in another company. So you have that 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 um, that environment for you to to make use of your life or you to grab on something, you know. So um, almost to graduation, I realized that nah, I can't. <laughs> I can't go back home. So, I mean, the driving force of going back to the driving force of it was, I realized that there was a change. Um, there was a change or there was something that felt better and felt good um, working here in Europe than returning back home. And mm. honestly, it wasn't about the money anyways, but it's just the, um, the way of doing things here is, 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 is actually different. And it, uh, it has this, it has this good feeling, and then this appreciative um, or sense of like you, you are doing something that is being used, something that is being is, is doing a greater good, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean that that was the main driving force actually. That for me wow. to just decide to stay, and then I look for a job, and God being so good, I just I just found a job. And then, yeah, great one. So you you found an environment that allowed you to maximize your potentials. There yeah. was there was a greater reason to succeed than for you to fail, and and you just took up the opportunity. So, Joseph, yeah. what was your experience? Um, for me, um, I had actually started on my initial development in Ghana. I I'd like worked in Ghana for like seven years, and it was actually more like seeking like um, a new challenge, seeing was out here more and i think i had also i think um i had a few friends who had moved and uh, they started giving me some insights about how stuff was here the, the opportunity to learn more and mm -hmm. for me i'm i'm always for learning more things and broadening my um scope or or broadening what i know already and also like a new life um experience right um but for me, it was mostly actually to learn more, right? Mm -hmm. Because I realized um, what I was doing in Ghana and the stuff I was building in Ghana, even though it was cool, but on a larger scale, on a world scale, right, my skills were a bit limited, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and with talking to a few friends who had come earlier, yeah, I got to know, yes. So And when I moved, I also realized, yes, there was a whole lot more to learn right yeah yeah but I, I remember a friend of mine told me when he got here he realized he was a local champion in ghana mm. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and and yeah and it's true when he gets here you he realize there there's the next step there are other things <laughs> there are yeah. other higher things that you can learn and yeah and it's and all this is also like 
I think it's it's some is it gets to profit Ghana I actual sense because one day we might also take all this knowledge and all that and get back to Ghana and try to apply some of these things there. Yeah. So for me, it was for a new challenge to broaden my horizon and to learn new experiences. Yeah. All right. So yeah. the Kojo was a local champion in Ghana. Everybody was healing him until he crossed the border and that's probably going to be an experience meet but but the oh. beautiful thing is that you had this the foundation you needed to succeed yeah. there because the environment was configured for your success patrick you wanted to add something yeah yeah i wanted to add something um as could you could you could you also said um um you you build something like you said your local champion and after school or during my school, I realized that the things that I was studying mm. um, will not be useful <laughs> in Ghana because the infrastructure there is it's not even ready to even accept what what I was learning in school. You know, so mm. maybe to be best it to be across the year the system is already done. I mean, robotics, um, IoT, and artificial intelligence they are way yeah, even though we have guys in Ghana who are doing cool stuff or doing cool things, but they're not being supported by the government or anything. But here you have the governments who are constantly with the school, you know. So the government usually contacts the universities for ideas and then they fund the universities for them to, to develop it and then they can sell it out, you know. Mm. But in, on, unlike Ghana it's, or Africa, it's, it's something else. So you end up learning something or doing something and you realize that you are the only person doing it. You're not getting help, funding or anything from anywhere. So mm. That was one of the reasons why I decided to to stay because I realized that my skill set was not ready for the market back home in Ghana, and maybe I might be I get I'll get frustrated by this things trying to get us get mm. trying to get it started or something. So it would be best to just stay and then just use it here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that that your thoughts. I think it 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 smoothly leads us into the next question and the next video I'm going to show. But I, I, I like that fact that you're saying there's a big gap, and you've said it from the beginning, between our educational system and the, and the, and the kind of skills we need, both locally and internationally. And the local scale and, and local front, if we teach too much, so to speak, there's nowhere to practice. Uh, if we teach too little, we are not relevant globally. So it's, it's, a, it's a big dilemma which has to be bridged. And there's a part of the government to play on that, but then maybe there's also a part of those in diaspora who are being exposed to these things and who may be able to contribute back home we'll come to that question later let's watch this short video before i do that let me just thank uh michaela thank you for joining us michaela says this session is very informative i'm michaela from ghana happy to be here amanda amanda Kabme Sumabe says, I'm Amanda, a Ghanaian schooling in Germany and Japan. I've never seen that name in Ghana. I, I actually sounded Kenyan, but uh, I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> Welcome, Amanda. And Kafui also joined us. Kafui says, great education and insight. Thank you, Kafui, for joining us. Just give us a minute to uh, see this awesome uh, next video. Okay. Um, au machine learning et une maman qui vend au marché les, euh, par exemple n'importe quoi elle vend au marché qu'est ce que l'intelligence artificielle va lui amener euh, c'est ça la question que moi je pose souvent aux gens quand on, on apprend par exemple les, les, les digitales euh, l'intelligence artificielle par exemple le machine learning euh, ou autres compétences qui sont encore plus avancées Qu'est-ce que ces compétences-là apportent à l'Afrique actuellement mm. euh, C'est ça la question qu'on te pose souvent. Euh, quand on parle de l'intelligence artificielle, moi personnellement, je vois un pays qui est déjà très développé et euh, qui a besoin euh, de l'intelligence artificielle pour améliorer encore plus certaines choses. Euh, mais aujourd'hui en Afrique, le besoin il est très primaire. Mm. On a le machine learning. Hey, une maman qui vend au marché les all right so enrique says in french that what value is artificial intelligence machine learning to the mom to the mother who is going to the market every day to try to sell her goods <laughs> so in, in essence in, in structure that 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 point he's just saying how can we marry 
the skills we are learning with the problems of Africa. Now, Patrick and Joseph, you are solving problems in Europe. Now, assuming you were to solve problems uh, in Africa, like we said, you know, um, you know, maybe there's a way for you to contribute to the problems you are seeing, probably in our educational system. How, how, how do you think that will play? What do you think about Henrique's thoughts around the, 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 the alignment between what we are teaching ourselves in schools, the skills we are looking for, the technology we are trying to adopt, and the real problems of Africa? Patrick, first, please. <laughs> Uh, that's a <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's a difficult one because um, I'm, I, um, as I said, I grew up in Africa, so I know I know the the problems and challenges that goes on there. Um, I, I will not say education too because I just think that we should look at what we shouldn't try to copy exactly what they are doing in Europe or they are doing in America or elsewhere. But then we should look at what we need or what uh, what works for us as Africans, and try to improve it and do it well. Like for example, this mobile money, uh, this mobile money technology, to date, it doesn't work here in Europe. They still don't understand how it is, but it worked excellent in Africa. Yeah. You know, it works very well in Africa, efficiently. You know, and those are the things that we should look at. The things that. Yeah, we can pick the IoT, the machine learning, and those things. Look at the problems that we have in Africa. Then we use we use them to solve them. You know, there are some things that that we use here in Europe or in America that's just not necessarily needed in Africa. You know, so I don't know if I've answered the question correctly. Yeah, yeah, but... I, I I like the allusion to mobile money. Um, yeah, uh, the M-Pesa story is probably the most well-known story about mobile money. In the world, I mean, yeah. the, the 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 financial inclusion is like Africa practically leapfrogged because the technology was relevant in in our context. Mm -hmm. Villagers needed to have money from the cities. Yeah. There was there were a few banks who wanted to invest in brick and mortar in those extreme places, and exactly. so mobile money was the answer. The same, the similar case with mobile telephone in the first place where the infrastructure in terms of the uh, telephone lines was poor in many parts of Africa. So mm -hmm. when GSM came, it mm -hmm. simply exploded. Thank you for that yeah. insight. So, 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 so I, I think that um, there are so many things that we can, we can leverage on. We don't necessarily have to do some stuff because like automated cars and those things, because our road networks yeah. and stuff are not, are yeah. not <laughs> we don't have good road markings. So how would those cars, you know, but yeah. we should look at ourselves, our environment, what we really need, what's, what's, what is going to serve the people. I mean, this mm -hmm. mobile money, as we are talking about, there are so many businesses that come out of mobile money, so many uncountable, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that's what we should be, we should be driving more at. Yeah, we can have 5G network. Mm -hmm. um we can use iot's but let's use it in the way that somebody in the north Sabludundango, anywhere in ghana who cannot have access to to the mast or whatever can just have access to like basic internet like across the across the country mm -hmm. and most of this iot device or most of this iot device with 5g devices they don't they are most of them are wireless so mm. once they have internet they can easily communicate with each other and then we can i mean it can just serve some purpose and just mm. solve problems in africa the problems for africans are things that africans really need but not what the whole world needs we should rather mm. focus on solving issues in our country or in africa then the world will come and adapt from it and then they will learn from it. Like the mobile money and then the empire that we're talking about. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. In, in my profession, we'll call that business and IT alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, not just getting new IT toys, but asking yourself, how does this solve the problem? Before I turn over to Kojo, uh, Dr. Faith Mobia says, I support the decisions of Patrick and David, Patrick and Davis to have migrated, not because they were looking for survival, but it was for a new challenge, growth, and experience. By my, but migrating as a last resort is what we are opening the eyes of other youth to understand, that it is possible to still attract opportunities while remaining back in Africa. That's what Dr. Faith calls Jakpa in Niger or Jakpa in Ghana. 
If you didn't watch the last episode, you wouldn't know what Jackpot means. With a good reason to travel, it can earn us brain gain advantage when there is a return back home. In other words, Dr. Faith is saying, go to Europe, go to the Americas, go to Asia in honor. In honor. Make sure you're going in honor. And I think uh, Davis and uh, Kuju and Patrick went in honor with skills that they could sell to that environment. Yeah. Um, as I said from the beginning, um, a young self or me advising a young person, I will not advise you to leave Africa if you don't have any skill or any or any education because yeah i mean you come up you come here and you'll be disappointed you know yeah. and i think the mistake that a lot of our parents or our elders did was that they left home because they were frustrated with the system which is understandable and they felt like if you move to europe or abroad i mean things will you you find something to do with your time or with your mm. life you know mm um and so a lot of them left with no education no qualification so they end up doing this kind of menial jobs and stuff that people do so it kind of creates the impression that every black person who is abroad is doing this or doing that kind of menial job because i mean those who left earlier that's the way they came in with mm. but there are a lot of young guys who are coming today like davis and i and other friends who are in berlin and other places in europe who came in with education they came with with honor they came in with skill set and they are doing very good jobs and they are doing very well you'd be surprised where you find a lot of Ghanaians, nigerians here in germany yeah. yeah awesome awesome thank you for that patrick very encouraging joseph share your thoughts on this um subject on this subject of the uh, uh, factors that, drew, that pushed you up <coughs> to europe yeah um yeah so um from my experience um where africa is it's like africa is like in between yeah we have to think about solutions that work for africa like help us in our day-to-day -day activities and just like patrick said mobile money really has was was like a game changer because we needed that financial inclusion there and it has led to but like um e-commerce and all that improve improving in africa having e-commerce platforms in africa and other. um yeah, others can also come in um artificial intelligence and all that but it will creep in um it will creep in bit by bit right mm -hmm. um and it also actually has to go with um also has to go with the mentality right mm -hmm. the people in actual sense um Oh, one thing I realized here um, in Europe and in America is like um, what the government does is they move the people's mentality to a particular direction before they start introducing stuff to them. But for me, um, I worked five years straight for um, an American NGO, and mm -hmm. within and um, they, I think the U.S. government gave us like five million dollars to actually give um, technology solutions to farmers right in africa um um ashanti region bronga for the three northern regions but i've been everywhere in ghana yeah be, be, um because of, as a software developer and it actually gave me insight as to what actually ghanians i mm. what are the ghanians actually need i realized the ghanian in accra actually even doesn't know ghana mm. yeah. and it was an eye opener for me myself i realized yeah. that i don't even know my own country what my mm -hmm. Because um, we are in Accra, we have the networks, mobile networks there. We, we do video calls and all that. But you get to a village and and the network there is 2G. It's not even 3G. Yeah. For it to be 4G <laughs> and 5G. <Yes. clears throat> right. So whatever solution that you are building should... So um, I remember um, my own personal experience. When um, we had this solution, I wanted to build an agrotech solution for farming agents right mm -hmm. so they are farmers and they are um agri extension agents who have been to school in the community and all that, and they help the farmers with um coaching and all that to improve yield and all that so we had to come up with a solution that puts a lot of information on a mobile device for them and also they can use it to register farmers track farmers and all that now um we sat down in the office for like a month 
um, the, the US government had given us money, so money wasn't a problem, mm. right? We came up with a design, designed a cool interface with drawers and all that. The just um, an Android application. Um, we sent it to the to the farm, right? We met the agents, and the agents there were as as supposed to be the guys who have been to school, right? Mm. At least they have a level of education, like SHS high school, and all that. Then um, I was the only software development, the technical advisor on the project. And mm -hmm. whilst I was showing them how to use the software, I realized they were even having difficulties navigating. The because you have, you have, you have drawers. So if you have a drawer, you need to tap these three lines up there. Yeah, yeah, draw, yeah. And you select and all that. After that session with them, I came back to redesign the whole thing that we spent months designing. Why? Because for them, all they want to see is register farmer button, new farmer, a big button there, new yeah. farmer, yeah. add farmer. And a simple interface. But me being a software developer, seeing crazy interface and all that, I tried to go and, and so so now it's like what I was thinking and what actually what they are use them and what they can use. Right? So yes, it still boils down to um the point that we have to stick to stuff that the technologies that work for us and even we couldn't actually at the point um because of network issues and all that we had to come up with a solution for them to store everything on the phone when they come home to where they are they, they sync to the server so that's, that's your, your version the, of edge computing yes that, that taught me a lot of stuff actually building software for africa to work mm. in africa in europe I wouldn't have had these problems. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right. And and even then, when the financial equation came in, we had to use USSD. Right. Yeah. You, you, you hit a code, um, you pay, it links to mobile money, and all to not using any internet or anything because that is what they needed. Yeah. Right. But at the point in time, IoT and satellite intelligence and machine learning came in. Right, but uh, the thing is, with this thing, before they come, there has to be a base. There has to be like data already there. Mm -hmm. We had pharma data, we had um, final financial information, right? We had the location. The, the app could take the location of farmers for satellite to work in these locations. In location, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. So I think where Africa is now, now is Africa is. That's why I said we are in between. It's now is that phase of gathering the information. Now we have a few systems that are gathering those information and all that. The, the IoTs and the satellite um, machine learning and all that come because there are lots of, there's a lot of data for you to Available. actually yeah. predict, right? Mm -hmm. So whilst we are in this phase, those will come in, but um, in the near future. But at the pace that we are going, I think in five, 10 years, um, okay. um, we, should, yeah, we should be able to yeah, um, get it. because even um, IoT, we um, we came up with a solution because the farmers wanted to. Now I think wanted to track um, crop the, the crops, the health of the crops, um, whether there are pests on the farm and all mm -hmm. that. So I came up with a solution to put um, a camera on the on the farm, right? Mm -hmm. And the camera sends pictures like Pizza. in like um, intervals, like an hour. We, mm -hmm. we okay. We actually made the configurable, and the first this was like every six hours, every some mm -hmm. hours, and all that. And with those pictures, right? That, that's the collection, the data. With those pictures, the idea came to use deep learning. That's a machine learning. Deep yeah. learning is more like using images to get information based on how the color of the leaves look like. You can you can see if the crops are, are dying or, or they are lacking false frost. And they are locking, and 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 this was a cool project, and it worked. The images were being sent to the server, mm -hmm. and and the, and the next step was using it for machine learning, deep learning, and all that to actually inform the farmers. Okay, now predict. we can predict. Yeah, we cannot predict that. Okay, now we know the crops around this area lack phosphorus. Is something wrong with the soil? Mm -hmm. Right. The, yeah. So we are getting there, but mm -hmm. the base is like gathering the information, which now we have companies in there in Ghana, like Agro Center and all that, 
playing around with the farmers, getting that information and all that. Then from wow. that, but it's it's all it's still it's still boils down to the government mm -hmm. getting involved in this things. If the Ministry of we came up with all these solutions, we presented to the Minister of the Ministry of Agriculture, and we know what happens when you get this to the government. Mm -hmm. It goes through this long bureaucratic, and they were cool, cool solutions. But did they ask you for who, which party you belong to? <laughs> <laughs> As you know, um, <laughs> but uh, but but yeah. uh, this was a U.S. government funded project. Yeah. funded by the government. Then mm. at the point that I sat and read, and I was like, "Can't the government put in money to fund these projects?" Because it was funded by the U.S. The bosses were U.S. business, but. Yeah. This project was being implemented by Ghanaians. Yeah. The managers were the product owners were Ghanaians. The software developer is a Ghanaian. So it's not that we don't have the skill set. The skill yeah. set is in Ghana, mm -hmm. but, but it has to take the US government to bring a project for Ghanaians to actually express their skills. Yeah. 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 Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and the thing is, when, when it got to the Ghana government, yeah. uh, uh, everything came to us. Um, they always give us, I think, five million for like five years or so. And in the, in the five years, we had done this, this, and all the data was there, all the experience was there, and all that. But um, after five years, we moved it to a, a company. It was supposed to become like an enterprise or a company, or the government picks it up, mm. right, and moves it along. And that's where the project came to a standstill. So cool. all yeah. time for all that distance. Okay. So we are, technology-wise, yeah, we are in the data, like, collection stage pillar and IoT machine learning they will come as time goes on. Yeah, just like we took the pictures and the idea mm -hmm. came like can you use deep learning to actually analyze, analyze and yeah. stuff. Even if, even um, when the satellite imagery came in, it started giving us weather predictions, um um, um what do you call it aerial soil history from 1980 and all that mm -hmm. too. Oh. And when I realized that the root the Europeans and Americans have this data. That's why even the the little agriculture they are doing here is progress because it is data driven. Yeah. Yeah. So thank I you for that. Uh, thank you so much. That's a lot of insight. And what you said. Sorry, sorry, sorry Patrick, just one minute. Yeah. What you said also reminds me of Zenvos. Zenvos is uh, a product by Indubise Kekwe. It takes telemetry of the soil, of the environment, humidity, yeah, yeah, yeah. sends it up to the cloud, does machine learning, mixes it with data in the markets. Yeah. We even predict what people are asking for to that extent, you know, uh, built on cloud based systems. Zenvos is an interesting project too. So, Patrick, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah. Um, earlier, earlier, I said that um, in my study in the university here, uh, I noticed that the government has a close relationship with the university, and that's one problem that we that we that we that we have yeah. in Africa. So the minister is doing his own thing. Meanwhile, the university has has invested a lot of time. They have the information. You can just contact the university. The university can do a further research on it and provide the solutions for you. But that's one of the problems that we 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 have in Africa because. The minister or the party comes, they have their own plans of what they want to do, and they don't have any research or any data backing what they want to do, and then they, they try to implement it, you know. And trust me, those things will not work. But one thing I realized here in Europe is that the government is very close to the university. So most of the projects that we even do in school or in, in the universities here, they are projects that are coming from the government. Mm -hmm. And they want solutions for it, or they want uh, they want a form of confirmation. And the government will fund you for you to do it. And once it's done, the government just takes it up and then they just implement it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. so okay. that's one problem we have. We have a, there's a very big gap between the invest the university and then the government, and that's where you're supposed to get all the brain and then the distance from. Even though they are theory stuff, they are theoretical stuff, I feel like maybe because there's no money to fun in the practicals just do the theoretical stuff and then just leave it but mm -hmm. the government can invest something some money to the universities for them to do the practical aspect there are so many things like in our Greek that davis just mentioned there's so many opportunities in our Greek that we can leverage on with technology and do a lot of things to even start exporting crops 
just yeah. this uh, this problem that happened in Ukraine and Russia. I couldn't even believe that Ukraine and Russia are having a war, and Africa is suffering because they're not getting maize from Ukraine. And I, yeah. I, I, it doesn't even add up to me because we have fertile soil. We are on a tropical region. We are the ones who are supposed to be providing those things to the world, not the other way around, you know. Mm. Because they are using data driven and they are using all these things from the universities and all this from which they are using. So they're able to uh, farm in the in the in the what's the name? They're, they're able to farm in the, search. in the big quantity. Yeah, they mm -hmm. do the farming in a big quantity that they can yeah. serve Last the year. country and even export it out. We have vast lands in Africa, but we're not we're not investing in data, we are not yeah. investing in it, and then it's just you know, wow. So, yeah, so, so there's, there's up, a lot of that, yeah, to finish up, I think that the university and then the government have to be, be closer enough. The mm -hmm. people in government have to be be working with the university to get more information on what yeah. to do. So 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 we have a lot of alignments to do. We have alignments between the skill sets of young people and the problems on the ground. We have alignment between what we are focused on in terms of our teaching and the problems that we have in our environment as well as relevance to the globe. We have an alignment between what the government is uh, driving as policy and what universities are researching on. But again, like we always say, uh, we can always keep waiting for the government. Are there, are there areas where the private sector, the di diaspora can step in and say, we can take up this project just like the US uh, funded for a while. Are there, are there opportunities for the private sector to do the push and then uh, show the light, so to speak? Maybe that's something we also have to think about. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with a, another short video uh, and we ask the last question today. <music> Take a look at this quick video and then we ask the next question. Uh, from... Yes, so one government must do in order to maximize this opportunity that uh, opportunities that the remote world is offering. Because we've talked about privatization, and um, so there are issues about privatization. And um, when it comes to affecting a the proper tax system, it has to go through some question. The question of residency comes in, and that is where a lot of opportunities are being missed by this organization, by government. Um, because you're looking at where is this person earning from and who is paying. So a lot of a lot of government are yet to understand to come up to speed with technology that will be able to um, track who is earning what and from where are they earning from. Yes, so one government must do in order to maximize this opportunity that uh, opportunities that the remote world is offering. Because we've talked about, about taxation and um, so there are issues about taxation and um, when it comes to affecting a Proper tax system it has to go through some question. The question of residency comes in, and that is where a lot of opportunities are being missed by this organization, by government. <coughs> um, because you're looking at where is this person earning from and who is paying. So a lot of a lot of government are yet to understand to come up to speed with technology that will be able to. Um, track who is earning what and from where are they earning from. Yes, yeah, so what government must do in order to maximize this opportunity. All right, so we're going to talk about taxation. I hope that sound was clear. I realized that I hadn't turned on the 
the, the, the volume. Now, the question is, you uh, for those who are working remotely and those who are working in the diaspora, are there, are there ways in which uh, you can contribute back to your home country in terms of taxes? Is that something that looks palatable to you? Is that something that will make sense in the con uh, current context? So, Patrick, let me hear from you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah, I think um, us in the diaspora, we, we, we pay a lot of taxes through um, sending money back home. Remittances. <laughs> because okay. we, because Remittances or taxes? <laughs> we contribute a lot of money to, to the government on, on, on the remits that we send back home, you know. <laughs> So um, I don't know. I don't know how how it's going to work. That um, because we we pay taxes here, and I mean yeah. this is this is where we live. You know, this is where we are, and, and so we pay we pay our taxes here. and paying taxes and pay taxes back home is like double taxing. You know, we use we use the services here. We don't. Okay, if you're working remote, that's fine. If you're working okay. remote in Africa and you're paying your taxes there, that's fine. But me, I'm here, and I, and I, <laughs> I work here. I use the services here. So, I mean, if I'm paying the taxes here, yeah, I mean, that's the right thing to do, you know. But mm -hmm. I'm also paying taxes in a way or contributing to the government. I think okay. statistically, some, some there was a statistic that came up that I think in a year, people who send money home was about three billion dollars to Ghana. Yeah. In a year. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of that about of that number, but that's a lot of money, you know. Ghana government is chasing IMF for for a three billion dollar uh, bailout, and yeah. and people who are sending money back home can contribute that amount of money to the government already. So, I mean, for me, <laughs> for us here in abroad to pay taxes back home, I don't think it's it's, it's something fair. <laughs> okay, what about that. something like tax treaties, where where the gov the two governments agree and say, look. If you're going to collect taxes from my citizens, collect this percentage because I'm already collecting from them in a way. What do you think? Yeah, but it, it also depends on does it this also depends on the agreement of the government. So for instance, yeah. if if the government is the one who is facilitating the the employment or the connection to to people or sending people outside to work, then I mean it's fine. It makes it makes sense for the government to for the government to take some tax out of it. You know, if the government is saying Okay, so I want to send developers to your country, or they'll be working remotely in your country. So you pay them through me, and I tax them. I mean that's fine. But if the individual himself has gone out of his way to go to the process to to get the job, and then he's living here in abroad, um, he doesn't use any services back home, anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't use uses use all of them here. Then. I, I don't think that it's fair to, for the person to pay taxes back home. Yeah. Okay, David, what are your thoughts? Remember, <clears> this <throat> is a question about patriotism. So share your thoughts. Uh, yeah, so um, I will, um, I think I saw the project on his first point. Um, yes. Even 2021, that's last year, um, remittances back to Ghana was like $4.5 billion. That's a yes. lot of money. It, that the government, yeah, that so it means us here in the diaspora really, really <laughs> contributing even on the remittances bits to them. Okay, but that's that's also a side, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm for yeah, I'm for taxation, right? B but the thing about um, taxation, especially like I'll, I'll take Ghana for instance, working, working remotely, right? Is even that the structures do not even force you working remotely to pay taxes, right? So let me give you a typical example. A remote worker in Ghana is paid dollars or euros, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the, that euro or dollar is sent to his account in Ghana, right? Yeah. And when he gets the money, it is at his own discretion to go and pay taxes. Yeah. The government does not come after him or her for anything, right? So just like Dr. Faith said, yeah, there is no technology to track who is getting what and where is come where where is coming from for it to be taxed. Mm. In that case, it's not the fault of it. Um, 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 over here in Germany, right? The finance officer, the tax office, right, has access to bank accounts 
they can actually track what's coming in and they have that authority to do that right so now th this th so over here you realize that this is a government who is actually making efforts to actually get a taxes so until we put in the right structures to to actually get because it, um a lot of remote now and and now remote work in ghana has grown from the i know a lot of people doing remote work in ghana the companies mm -hmm. keep bringing their jobs then and, and i can tell you like 80 to 90 percent of them don't pay taxes because mm -hmm. they have to go and pay themselves and no, no one is tracking what's coming at the bank and all that talk. okay yeah. You, okay, remote worker, you, you've been earning so, so, and so, and so. Where is your tax? If you go and if you keep asking, they will pay. But it, so far as there's no um, structure like that. And, 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 and the thing is, yeah, just like also is that the government of Ghana can come up with, so that it doesn't become like a double taxation system. Like the government of Ghana, the government of Germany, okay, I have this number of professionals here working the paying taxes. Okay, can I have this percentage of every Ghanaian here or mm -hmm. but that can be done at the Ghanaian level so that doesn't and it doesn't end up like the Ghanaian is being taxed but Sorry. um uh, America has a funny way of you know like if you are living abroad in America you have to file your tax returns now but they do because they are like the superpower they have that bargaining power with <laughs> any and other country yeah but um for a country like Ghana, it has to be like more like negotiation. Okay, maybe you get two percent or three percent, and that can also like um, help the Ghana without making it feel like I'm being double taxed. I'm being taxed yeah. and I'm being, um, I'm being taxed in Ghana. So I think, yeah, I'm I'm for taxation. But um, if, if um, for me here as a Ghanaian, if I'm supposed to pay double taxes here and in Ghana, right? The taxes I pay here, I kind of see it being used. <laughs> yeah, I know the roads are <laughs> hospitals. That's not, really, but if I'm paying in Ghana, I get to Ghana right from the airports. I get pissed. I'm, how am I paying all this money here? And I'm getting on bad roads. And so, mm -hmm. so it's um, the issue about tax is more like, okay, I give and I give. Like, it's more like give and take, right? But in Ghana, it was like you are giving and you're not getting. You're you're giving not, and giving. Yeah, right. So if it makes it that way, the, the, even 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 if you're a patriot, right? Yeah, the patriotism the patriotism is like <laughs> killed when you move outside. You're supposed to pay something in terms of remittances. We all have family and all that. We send it there. But taxation, um, what we get from what we are even in ghana when you're in ghana it kills when you move out here even if you are patriotic it, it, the, the, um at the point in time it becomes a bit of logical that i'm paying all this what am i what will i get from ghana and all mm -hmm. that so at the government level they can talk to each other okay i have to so ghanaians here if you can get a percentage of their taxes that they pay you there and i think that would be okay well thank you so much for that uh so it's it's a dilemma between the trust we have for our governments and uh patriotism um yeah. i think it was last week there was a conversation between the godmother of Prince, uh, king charles and a black woman uh who was of caribbean descent uh her name was ngozi ngozi is actually a nigerian name so i i, I, I am not sure how her descent went through <clears throat> and one of the things I said to myself was, if she was a Jew, for example, and every Jew in the world, wherever they are, they are not, there's no question about their ancestry. They don't delay in telling you, I'm from Israel. My money goes back to Israel. So maybe for us Africans, uh, we, we are yet to build up something solid to be proud of about our heritage. So when somebody's probing our heritage, it looks like racism. It looks like some other things. So that's that's another side to to the conversation around: Do we have something to be proud of about our, our ancestry, where we where we come yeah. from? Even Sinek, uh, is it Sinek? Uh, um, yes, the the recent Indian British Prime Minister of of Britain. 
the uh, Modi came to him and they had began to have agreements on, on how India will benefit from the fact that uh, a person of Indian heritage is now the prime minister of um, the UK. So those are thoughts for us to think about. Let's watch this quick video. Sauf que j'ai cherché le visa, je ne l'ai pas obtenu. J'ai cherché le visa dans toutes les ambassades. Je suis même parti en Zambie pour obtenir un visa des États-Unis, mais je ne l'ai pas obtenu en 2016. Euh, pourquoi je ne l'avais pas obtenu Parce que l'ambassade des États-Unis disait que euh, j'allais rester pour du bon euh, aux États-Unis, donc je n'allais pas rentrer. C'est tout à fait normal à cette époque-là. Mais aujourd'hui, en fait, euh, je suis arrivé avec mes amis à créer euh, IT Society Africa simplement parce que j'ai regardé les problèmes autour de moi. J'ai regardé euh, les gens qui cherchent de l'emploi, j'ai regardé les gens qui ont ces jeunes-là par rapport à mon expérience personnelle. Euh, quand j'ai obtenu mon diplôme en 2016, je voulais... OK. So that, that uh, discourse brings us to our last question for today. In Henrique's experience, he wanted to do, go to the United States. Uh, he was bounced. That's how we say it in Nigeria. They denied him visa. He said, you are coming here. You have other plans. And after a lot of effort, he decided that he was going to solve a problem here and created ITOT Africa. So the question is for Patrick and for Davis today, what would it take to make you return to your home country? What opportunity would you see and say, yes, I have to go back to Ghana? Is there a job offer, some salary, a business idea? Is there something that could make you say, today I need to go back? Patrick. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, my, my question back is, my question that I was asked is that, um, what is the definition of home? What is the definition of home? <laughs> like? Okay, home is where you were born or where you grew up. <laughs> yeah, does it doesn't necessarily mean that where you were born should, should be your home or something. I personally think home, home is or uh, a place is where where you feel comfortable, where you feel mm. at home, where you where you have um, everything, you know. Mm. Um, I I was I, I would say I was I grew up in Ghana, but. In a way, I was I, I'm a Ghanaian, but mm. I I feel like a, a foreigner too in my country, you know. Mm. Um, so that's the question. Like, <laughs> where do you call home? You know, mm. it can you can be somewhere. It can be in Nigeria. It can be in Kenya. It can be in South Africa. I mean, if the people good, if the people they are good and the vibe there is okay, you can equally call that place your home. And that 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 brings me to the topic of um us in the diaspora uh, out, outside the country because we always have it in our mind that um maybe one day we return home so we we don't live our life to the fullest where we are you know okay so we always have this double mindset like um yes i might return back home so i'll not do any investment in this country i'll rather do all my investment back home i'll build a house i'll do this i'll do that mm. but i know already when you go home to visit or something you just spend a week or two and then you are back here again i mean this is where you live this is where you are so 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 for me for me i mean moving back home uh, it would be a challenge especially for for someone yeah. who has a family here right now yeah it, it would be a, it would be a challenge it takes to take a lot to 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 tell me to move me back home unless maybe I have retired and mm. I feel like, okay, I, my services or what I've learned here will be needed more back home in, in, back home in Ghana or back in Ghana, mm. then, then, <laughs> then that's fine. But then the definition of home for me is like kind of a, a gray area. It's not too defined for me because I feel like it's the world. I mean, today you are here, tomorrow you are there. Unless maybe you are you're an expert who travels everywhere like a pilot or somebody who 
who you have a home base that you go to, but then maybe every two weeks you go here, you go here, you go here, you go there. That, that's fine. But then if you're somewhere and then you feel like this place, I'm comfortable and then I can live the rest of my life here. I mean, you can call it your home too. doesn't matter where, where it is. And if you have that mindset, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are. You can just call it your home. Yeah, so... Wow. I don't know what to make. That's what I'm saying. I don't know what to make me. What to make it? It has to take a lot, eh? And it's not about the money. No, it's yeah. never about the money. But it's just about the peace of mind. You know, peace mm. of mind, and then the basic amenities of life. I don't want to wake up in the morning and then thinking of what am I going to eat? What am I children mm. going to eat? How am I going to? How am I going to do that? You know, I don't want to have that experience. For personally, for me personally, I feel like home is where you feel comfortable and where you can have access to everything that you want yeah wow thank you for that that's insightful uh could you uh yeah what, so, what will bring you back um for me uh i think i'll just go maybe the um more like the work culture if like um the work culture in ghana like uh improves like we have like you'll be with an employer for three, four, five years, and all then they, they don't even have a training budget for you to actually improve. So if you don't yeah. actually improve on the side for yourself, the employer doesn't. But over here, companies have training budgets, right? They, they tell you, oh, um, the, this year you have so and so money for training for yourself and giving time to go and train and do other courses and other to improve yourself. And it's like, they want you to improve but in in um in ghana it's like the, when an employer gives you it's like he's doing a favor and even making it like after that you leave the, that investment will go and and you um you are going to leave or something i remember when these like training budgets and all that i asked one of my bosses i'm like so you're investing you're investing all this in me and what if yeah, i do all the trainings and i leave and and his and his answer to me was like, okay, what if I don't let you do all these trainings and you stay? Hmm. Yeah, th these this are different. Is, this was in Europe, right? Yeah, in Europe. This person yeah, reacts. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It was like, what if I don't let you do the training to improve yourself and you stay? You you came in and you are still the same, and you being like not adding any value to yourself. And when you do these trainings. You actually add also to the value of the company improves yeah. as another these are like this is how an european thinking this is how an european thinks and the ghanaian things like this so our um our mindset right um change our mind. but um for me i don't mind going back um coming back to ghana and all that i'm here to build more knowledge more capacity and all that to actually go back hey, if um i remember one thing that um Kwame Nkrumah said he said if your education does not benefit your nation it's useless mm. yeah i'm here i was educated in ghana in other sense our university was like subsidized for us by the government for us to go and study so i was like trained on something like a scholarship distance mm -hmm. but, uh, so uh, um i for me for me personally, one day I'll all this experience and all that. But um, now, like maybe a consultancy for the government of Ghana with this um, digitization and all that won't be bad for okay. me to consult for the government or in that phase. But I've seen um, when I read the news about some of the digitized solutions that yeah. they are providing and all that. They are, they could have done it better and they do shoddy stuff and mm -hmm. all that. The, 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 um, uh, these are things that could have been done easily in another way and with mm -hmm. expertise from outside, this and all that. But, but first of all, it has to be the mindset. If the government right, is in a position to allow um, professionals like us in the diaspora, we have seen more and I've seen more systems and all that, um, the level playing ground to come and contribute and all that. That's what. Uh, 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 but but now with all your experience and when you get to Ghana, the bureaucracy will stifle you. Yeah. Even if 
yeah so the 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 best i can is like consult for the government this mm -hmm. uh, is another but um until the mindset changes and the government also like opens up this one um opens up another that's why fully moving to ghana yeah if these structures are in place oh why not after all, right. all yeah we yeah, it's if ghana moves forward and the coming generation um able to get some of the things that we didn't get and we're able to like some things that happen here in europe also becomes normal in ghana and people are able to get access to it's it's good for all of us mm. oh thank you for that thank you awesome you see how uh an hour quickly passes by <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> an hour, yeah. an yeah, hour and 22 minutes. 22 minutes wow yeah Yes, quickly passes by. So, and it's, I think it's been insightful. Uh, we've shared our hearts. We'll be closing in the next uh, two, three minutes. I'll just play this last video and we close. <laughs> Okay, I hope I'm back. I, I, I don't know what happened to the video, it just got stopped. Yes, so thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much, Joseph Kojo, for sharing your lives with us. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of uh, hits on LinkedIn for deeper details from those who want to jackpa, you know, <laughs> those who want to move to Europe quickly to tell you, to, to the, the, maybe those things you could not say in public, they want to hear it. They want to know how you actually did it because a lot of people are still trying to move. But I think you've shared amazing thoughts around being prepared for that move, uh, learning the relevant skills, uh, the, the, the tasks that we must do as young people, as people to progress in our lives, as well as those that are left for the government to do to create an environment that fosters progress. It's been amazing, it's been awesome. And for those who are out there who joined us, uh, so many new people uh, joined in today. I'm glad you um, spent time with us today. Uh, do share the video. Do subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And we look forward to seeing you another time. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thank you very much, thank you. Uh, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.